Hey HK fans, James here to bring you another firearm review from H&K Weapons from an armor and operator perspective. And I wanted to start with the pistol line, and if I was going to start there, I might as well start at the very beginning. For H&K, that would mean the HK4. Now, the HK4 dates all the way back to the uh, middle 1960s, and if you think about the company at a time uh, like that, uh, this is the post- World War II era. They had formed themselves in the late 50s and now in the 60s were gaining uh, some good success rearming the German uh, military with the G3 battle rifle and they decided that they needed to expand their product line and design a pistol so they could compete with uh, those contracts for the police and military as they were continuing to rearm themselves as well. If you think about the German Forces at that time, uh, they were still armed with former World War II era uh, handguns, uh, mainly Walther PPs and PPKs, Mauser HSCs, and N32 caliber uh, mainly. Uh, so for H&K, whose three primary founding members uh, had all been former members of the Mauser company, it made sense for them to look at designs that they had done at that point. Uh, and one specific uh, founding member, Alex Seidel, had been the primary designer on the Mauser HSC. So it's no surprise that that was really the, the genesis for his plans for the first pistol from H&K. And uh, that's where we went. So get yourself comfortable, grab yourself a nice tasty beverage, and we'll kick right into this. So in 1964, HK set off to produce their first handgun. And Alex Seidel, their lead designer, looked back to his experience with the Mauser HSC and used that as the genesis for the program. As you can see here from these initial uh, prototype photos, he, he even kept the artistic angled front trigger guard in that initial prototype. Uh, later that gave way, as you see here with the production pistol on the right, um, that left and he went on to make numerous other improvements. Mainly, uh, they wanted a multi-caliber option for the European market. And they settled on 22, 25, 32, and 380, as you can see here in this early promotional um, poster, as those were very popular in, the, in that market at the time. <clears throat> the pistol itself is a um, simple blowback operated pistol, and it fires in double action, single action mode, meaning that... You have one long trigger pull as the hammer is cocked and then released. And then every subsequent round afterwards, the hammer will be back as the slide cycles and recoil, and the subsequent shots would be single action. Uh, the receiver is made out of an, an alloy that uh, has a surface hardening layer, or what they called a hard coat method, to give it a little bit more rigidity <clears throat> and handle the higher pressures of the larger cartridges. And then it has a stamped steel uh, slide, which they had experience with, with their G3 and later MP5 designs. Um, it has a slide mounted safety, much like many of the other uh, German handguns of the time. <clears throat> Wrap around polymer grips. The hammer uh, actually is closed there in the rear position to prevent uh, dirt from opening as well as when it's in the cock position, uh, which is kind of neat. And then the sighting system, it has just a basic small rear uh, square notch that's winded adjustable, and then a welded in front sight. And there's a little trough that's, uh, that's cut out of the top of the, the slide to give a little bit more of a low profile setting. Not very impressive in today's uh, market, but at the time that's uh, kind of reminiscent of what it was. Uh, no ambidextrous controls, obviously very much set up for a left-handed shooter with a little bit of a thumb raise here on the left side of the grip. And also uh, reminiscent of pistols of the time, a European style heel magazine release. The magazines would come out. Magazines for the pistols were all eight rounds for uh, the 22, 25, and 32. And in 380, they were seven round capacity. So another interesting feature uh, for HK pistols and the HK4 specifically is the barrel design. H&K uh, uses a cold hammer forging process, which 
uh, increases the longevity of the barrel itself. But on the HK4, even though when you separate the slide from the receiver, you notice that the barrel is, is captive inside the slide. But when the weapon is assembled, the barrel is actually fixed, uh, which makes it inherently more accurate than a reciprocating or tilted barrel design pistol. When produced, you could order the pistols in any of the caliber uh, configurations you wanted and add additional barrel uh, conversion kits as desired. Uh, the most popular, obviously, in the European market was the 32 caliber, um, and here in the U.S. market, we saw more 380s. Uh, most of the conversion kits were just with 22 barrel sets, like you see here, which came with the uh, additional barrel and uh, magazine, a screwdriver that allowed you to remove the backing plate and had a little cleaning rod a collapsible set inside the grip of the screwdriver and then the 22 caliber uh, extractor. Some larger sets like you see here in these photos uh, would give you four caliber options uh, all in one box set. And then the most desirable for collectors was from H&R who is the original importer for H &K, uh, HK4 pistols at the time uh, gave you uh, a complete box set of matching uh, conversion kits. Now let's talk about safety. Uh, it's one of the things I've always been impressed about the design features that H&K engineers put into their weapons. Safety is always a primary concern. And with the HK4, we see six different safety factors that have been implemented. First uh, and foremost, obviously, is a safety catch. It's mounted here on the left side of the pistol. Um, so it's not ambidextrous, and this is common with uh, German weapons of this period uh, in line with the original HSC design as well as the Walther PPE and PPK. Uh, unlike the PPE and PPK, though, uh, this does not serve as a decocker. Uh, what it does do, uh, though, is it rotates uh, the firing pin out of position with uh, the actual hammer. And so if you look here on this uh, instructional chart, what you'll see as we move from the top line from left to right, uh, the first diagram shows the hammer is cocked in the rear position. And what you'll notice is with the safety on, the firing pin is out of line with the hammer and the uh, rear of the chambered cartridge, meaning the tail end of that firing pin is slightly lower uh, than the angle of where the front of the firing pin is. Uh, and that's because the safety itself rotates it out of that position. In the second diagram to the right, you'll see now the safety is off. The hammer is still caught back the rear, but now the safety off, that firing pin's in line uh, directly from where the hammer will strike it into the firing pin. And then the next diagram to the top right, you'll notice now the hammer is forward, but the safety's on. And again, you can see how the hammer is unable to strike the firing pin in this position because the rear of the firing pin is rotated down and the safety's on. And then moving to the bottom left diagram, now we see the hammer forward with the safety off. The firing pin is in line between the hammer to the rear and the chambered cartridge in the front. So uh, the second feature is a firing pin block, and we've just discussed that. Um, it's part of that feature that when the rotation of the firing pin into the uh, safe position, it also locks uh, the firing pin's forward movement as well. Uh, the third feature is what they call a trigger block. And what that means really is what most of us know as a magazine disconnect. So as I show you here with the magazine um, not inserted properly and I have the hammer cocked on the pistol, I try and pull the trigger and the trigger is blocked. It won't move forward. So what you're looking at is this top bar here is your magazine disconnect safety. As I push the magazine into place, you'll notice it now rises up uh, under spring tension. And now when I pull the trigger, the hammer will fall. So this weapon won't fire without a magazine inserted. Uh, the fourth safety feature is the disconnector. Okay, the disconnector, where we'll find that here, is this piece that moves from the left to the right side. And as you'll notice, at its, at its at rest position, it's raised up under spring tension. And when it's engaged, it actually moves down. Okay, 
Now, when in at rest position, and a magazine inserted, when I pull the trigger, the hammer will fall, okay? But if I pull the trigger and I press it out of position, now I pull the trigger, you'll notice the hammer will not fall, okay? And why is that? Well, it's because the disconnector inside the slide, uh, when it's in position and it's raised up, it's sitting in this recess at this angled portion right here. Okay, and how it prevents out of battery fire is that if the slide is out of battery, meaning if it's pulled back at any position further to the rear, then that disconnector is gonna ride along this channel here and it's gonna be pressed down. Okay, and again, pressed down, meaning it will not allow the hammer to fall. Okay, so that's our fourth safety feature. The fifth one is that the uh, hammer safety is, is bent. Okay, and what that means is that there's basically a catch that prevents the hammer from striking the uh, firing pin if you're cocking the hammer back and you let it go, meaning you have to pull the trigger in order for it to happen. So here's an example. So if I'm gonna go ahead and pull the hammer back, my fingers off the trigger, and I start to pull it back, and then, oop, I let it go, um, as in such, and it falls forward. Now let's look at the angle of where it stopped. Okay, you can see this little metal piece right here. So that's where it's in line, and you can see that that's to the rear of this axle that holds the disconnector. So again, I'm pulling it back, I let it go, it stops right at that point. Okay, now if I pull it all the way back, and I pull the trigger and I let it go forward, now you'll notice it goes forward to that, and it's now in line with where the axle is. Okay, and where the axle is, is where the firing pin actually strikes. So it's actually a catch that prevents the hammer from falling forward all the way to strike the firing pin, unless you pull the trigger. Okay, and then the last safety feature is your um, safety for disassembly. And what that means is there's a disassembly uh, lever here forward of the trigger, and you actually have to have the weapon on safe in order to disconnect it. So if I want to pull the, the magazine, or I'm sorry, the slide off, and I've got the safety off, I pull this down and nothing's gonna happen, it, it won't release for itself. I have to put the safety on and then I can release the slide off of the receiver. And again, that is just an additional safety to prevent in case you forgot to check that it's cleared and you're putting your fingers inside here, inside the trigger guard with the hammer back and the safety off, you wouldn't actually discharge around. You'd have to have the safety on in order to disconnect the slide. So those are the six safety features that were built into the HK4. Okay, so let's talk about the trend problems that we have with the HK4. And really, uh, it comes down to trying to be a jack of all trades and really master of none. Uh, and in that I mean uh, taking what is really the original HSC design and adapting it to fire all four different calibers uh, really proved to be a long term a bit too much, especially in the 380 chamber. Uh, so what you see in the different uh, calibers is obviously a different barrel, but what you'll notice here with these two barrels, 22 here in my left hand, a 380 in my right, is that they each have a caliber specific recoil spring that's obviously weighted for that caliber. And you can see how they're actually semi permanently installed onto the barrel so that they don't come off, you know, normally and get mixed up when you're doing maintenance on the pistols. So this is designed to give a little bit more uh, cushioning uh, onto the receiver. Well, next you see on the receiver, uh, they created an additional buffer system that fits in this slot uh, right here in the uh, front of the receiver, right forward of where the locking block area is that the barrel locks, or then slide lock into the uh, receiver. And what they designed there would be for a small polymer uh, buffer, like a horseshoe design, would fit in that slot along with a little metal backing plate. And what that was designed to do was provide additional recoil buffering to prevent the front tang on the slide from impacting directly into that locking block area as the slide went into to recoil. Well, what you have is over time, uh, the degradation of these buffers. Uh, they just you know are gonna wear out this little polymer, especially when they're exposed in an open position with no cover around it to solvents and dirt and heat and humidity, all those kind of things. 
And uh, where we see this most often are owners of these guns. They're you know, 30, 40 years old, probably never changed the buffer in that. They go to pull them out of the safe and shoot them, probably in 380 caliber, the most pow powerful cartridge. And they end up having their slide lock up after a few rounds. And then they hear some rattling around inside. When they can finally get the gun apart, what they find are just chunks of remnants of this buffer and the backing plate left. And if they're lucky and they stopped quickly, they, they may have no damage or just minor damage. As you can see here with, uh, with the front of this receiver, there's just a little bit of chipping right here um, that has begun. But if not, and they keep shooting, what you can actually have is significant damage where the entire front section of this locking block has been broken away. And there's actually no way to repair this at this point. So this one obviously is completely trashed at that point. So what's the solution? Well, the first thing you can do is I have a, a buddy of mine who makes a aftermarket replacement buffer. Um, it's of a stronger uh, polymer uh, construction and it's actually thicker. So it's twice as thick and negates the need to use the backing plate as well. So a lot of customers who you know, end up destroying their recoil buffers, they end up destroying their backing plates as well. And with the parts of these guns no longer in production, having a new buffer that needs a backing plate to fit as well doesn't help them. So replacing them both with this aftermarket one fits right in there. Uh, now you're good to go and you can shoot again. Uh, but I would say that what I've seen from my experience of servicing these guns over the years is my recommendation to not shoot them in 380. Uh, it's just too powerful of a cartridge uh, for this uh, aluminum receiver and the rather delicate recoil system of it. If you have the opportunity to shoot it in one of the other three calibers, uh, that would be much more preferred and, and most likely going to give you a much less chance of damaging your pistol. So let's take a look at the slide and how they were able to design this to fire both centerfire cartridges and rimfire. Uh, I've gone ahead and pulled the extractor out of position so we can get a better view of the breech plate. And uh, what you guys should be able to see here, if I zoom in close enough, is on the breech plate, you have a center hole right there with the firing pin, as you can see, just barely sticking out behind it. That's where the center fire rounds are fired from. And then right above it, there's another hole. And that's where you can reposition the firing pin slightly at a higher angle so that it'll protrude out the top for rim fire. And then above it, you'll notice there's a flathead screw right there. I'll go ahead and remove this so we can see how this actually works. Now using a very long screwdriver, you're able to unscrew this long set screw and remove it and the breech plate. So the screw comes out, here's your breech plate, plate as you can see here there's a letter Z on the left side of it that's for zinter fire and on the back side there's a letter R for rim fire and so the facing of the breech plate is smaller on the R side for rim fire because that's where you're gonna uh, place the 22 cartridge whereas on the center fire it's larger obviously it's size for the largest uh, chambering of 380 but that's where you're gonna use for your center fire rounds, the 380, the 32, and the 25. And then what you're left with on the inside there is the actual firing pin with firing pin spring, and you can see that it is angled. So I can set it in position there for center fire, or if I'm gonna flip it around to rim fire, then when I put the breech plate back up, I'll make sure that I set it at that higher position and then lay the breech plate back on down in top of it. Pretty cool little design. Okay, and here we can see the 22LR specific extractor for the HK4 as it's marked as such. And this differs from the universal extractor, which has no markings. Uh, the universal extractor is what you see most often in the HK4 pistols, um, and it's supposed to work across all four calibers. Uh, but what we found is that in the 22 caliber pistols, often you have extraction issues, um, ejection issues without having uh, this proper one in place. Um, this is really rare. I, it's supposed to be with all the 22 uh, conversion kits, uh, but unfortunately it looks like it's been lost along the way uh, quite often. Uh, so if you want to shoot yours in 22, this would be the one that you would want to have set up. And now with the breech plate back in place, 
set up here with the uh, firing pin in the center fire position and the backing plate, uh, breech plate set in the center fire position. The only thing I would have to do to fire a 380 um, cartridge would be to now put in the 380 barrel and the 380 magazine. If I wanted to switch it back to 22, well then again, I'd just flip around that br uh, breech plate, angle the firing pin up into the higher position. If I had the uh, the extractor for the 22, like we just discussed, I would mount that in there as well and put in the 22 barrel and the 22 magazine. Uh, it's that simple. Another unique feature of the HK4 is the fact that when the last round is fired, the slide will lock back and it does so by use of the follower itself. So you can see the follower here in between the two magazine feed lips as that uh, magazine spring extends, pushes the follower up. Now the follower is going to block the forward movement of the slide again. And once the slide is locked back, there is no external slide release on the pistol um, for you to release the slide forward. And it doesn't work by coming over the top and doing a slingshot method. Instead, there's two ways to release the slide. The first is to take a new magazine, either loaded or unloaded, and insert it. And that will release the slide. Or, if you don't have a magazine at all in the weapon and you've locked the slide back to the rear, you simply pull the trigger to release the slide forward again. Here we see the HK4 uh, completely disassembled and freshly cleaned into all of its individual components, including this, the smallest spring known to man. Uh, so my recommendation is if you're not skilled and qualified on this pistol or you have a carpeted floor, I would not take this thing apart. So production on the HK4 ran from 1968 until 1984. And during that time, they produced a little over 38,000 of those, with the largest single purchase being about 12,000 going to the uh, German border police. And those went in 32 caliber with the 22 caliber conversion kits. And those you can find on the market kind of collectible these days, usually with a receiver marking uh, that says BUND or BUND to signify those pistols. Uh, so definitely not a wildly successful pistol uh, in terms of HK's uh, sales. Uh, but that really doesn't have anything to do with um, not being a good pistol design. It has to do with the market that it had to compete in at the time. Uh, so when you think about uh, the German military and police forces and, and the fact that they were really uh, heavily armed with those post-war guns that they got for free, why would they spend money to buy a gun that was very similar to what they already had? Uh, then you look at the European market, again, with lots of pistols that are similar to this, um, and it had to compete with the popularity of the Walther PPK design, specifically from those who uh, knew it from World War II era, um, as well as its um, obvious uh, attraction from the uh, James Bond 007 series. And then lastly, you have to look at where it came out in the time of German uh, police uh, era. Um, you know, it was released in 68, and there in the mid-70s, uh, we already saw the German police forces taking a significant look at replacing their 32 caliber and 380 caliber pistols with a 9 millimeter design. Um, and that's what led to the next series of pistols that we'll talk about in future videos. Okay, so let's summarize my thoughts as far as an armorer and operator perspective on the HK4. I think we've done a pretty good job of taking a deep dive into uh, the armor side of it. And I would just say that I think it's a great starting point for h &K, uh, coming onto the market, competing for police uh, government contracts, as well as wanting to get into the civilian market, taking something that's already a known commodity with the uh, HSC design and advancing it into multi-caliber options. Um, it's a pretty neat uh, place to be. And what's really not known as well is, is that really with that police service, even though they were mainly in 32, uh, when they were shot, they were mostly shot for qualification. And that's when the armorers would change them over to 22. Uh, so it became a little more economical. Um, but I think what we've seen in the longer term with these pistols, especially with the parts uh, support no longer there uh, and the degradation of those buffers, um, is just that uh, in 380, it, it's just too strong. 
uh, for the buffer system and the, and the alloy receivers. Uh, so it's one that if you have one, you definitely want to shoot it in one of the smaller calibers. Um, and from that standpoint, moving over to an operator perspective, um, because of those reliability failures that you have with the weapon, it's not one that I would want to trust my life with. Um, to have as a primary or secondary type weapon, um, but it is a great weapon if you want to start a new shooter out or kids out. If you're familiar with a Walther PP series or an HSC, it, it's very low recoiling, um, easy to shoot, um, and just enjoyable. And if you're into HK collecting, it's a great one to have uh, there in your collection as a starting point, especially if you can get one of the, uh, the uh, four barrel sets. Um, pretty nice one to have. I hope that you've enjoyed the video. I hope you've learned something. Um, and I look forward to, uh, to continuing this on with uh, some more video series on the pistols and, and carrying over where you'll see this initial design and how it transferred over to the next pistol and so on down the line. Um, but I appreciate you hanging in there with me. Uh, this is usually the part of the video where the host uh, will tell everybody that they need to like and subscribe and send money to them on their Patreon account. Um, but I tell you guys, uh, I don't care about any of that stuff. Um, if you've got money to, to spend, I, I'd rather have you spend it by buying another HK. Um, really, what you do for me is just uh, share, the, share the knowledge with other people. And if you have an h and and you need support, uh, give me a shout. Or if you're looking for unique training uh, for your H&Ks, that's what I'm here for. So until next time, guys, take care.